Today we've read quite a number of the Psalms. We've seen some of David's reactions and some of the things that he's been going through. This is such a view into his heart. And I'm sure each one of us have caught hold of different things today and can say, wow, God's just spoken that to me. Today, as we look at it, I'd just like to pull out something from Psalm 19, something that is just so beautiful. We serve a God who rules and reigns a kingdom. And a kingdom is based on law. It has, there are laws to any kingdom. And as we read that, we read six words which talk about the law. We read the word law, we read the word statutes and precepts, commands, fear of the Lord, and also ordinances. And that sounds like it's just repeating itself, but actually there is described the very structure of God's kingdom. Here in the UK we have a monarch, and when someone is taken to court, they're taken against the crown. The crown is the very base of all the law. The crown is the very thing that holds it all together. It is where the authority of the law comes. And when the Lord speaks of the law, he's talking about his authority. Now, from there, the law is set out and there are statutes. And his statutes describe and hold everything in place, how it all works. It is bigger than anything we can understand. But then we come down to his precepts. And those precepts are the instructions for how we live. And then we reach the commands, which are do this and do that, do this and do that, that we must be obedient to. And we then see that tucked in these six words about the law is the fear of the Lord. When we're driving along, we see these little yellow boxes by the side of the road, those feed cameras, and they are the eye of our police. And we stop and we slow down because we're aware that they are watching us. Those eyes are there, not to trap us, not to trick us, but they're there for our safety. The Lord, his eye is on us, and we walk in the fear of the Lord for our safety, because he cares and treasures us. And then we come to the ordinances, which is the judgment that will go with it. If we are walking in faith and walking according to the law, according to his commands, according to his precepts, according to his statutes, under the authority of his law, we have no reason to fear his ordinances. But if we turn away, there is that judgment. Today, as we've read, we've come upon a group of three psalms together, 22, 23 and 24. And these psalms speak something so powerful. In Psalm 22, we have nearly 20 references to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his life and to his death, and to what he is doing for us. When we look in the New Testament, you can almost see that psalm being outworked, which is beautiful, but it is speaking to us about the fact that Jesus is our Saviour. When we move on to Psalm 23, we discover that he is love for us, that he cares for us, that he is calling us to himself, that he is protecting us, that he is our shepherd. And then when we move on to Psalm 24, we see the declaration that he is the sovereign king, that he is our Lord and Master. I remember listening to David Pawson a few months ago and he just said, everybody wants God to be sovereign, but not everybody wants to be his subject. He has saved us, he is shepherding us, and he is calling us to serve him because he is the Lord. As we've read through six of David's Psalms today, we see different emotions coming through. We see his, his desire to trust the Lord and his, his hope is based on nothing else than God. And in Psalm 32, we read of him saying, Oh, the joy of him whose sin is forgiven. 
the, the joy when all that is against me, my entire slate is clean, that I've got nothing there against me, I have been forgiven. He said I was miserable when I tried to hold on and, and just didn't come and confess my sin, but when I confessed my sin, I received that cleanness. I received the cleansing flow. I received that joy. Jesus Christ died for us. He took our place. Our punishment was death and Jesus took that punishment. When we realize that and we grab hold of it, that joy just overwhelms. But then there is another joy when we ourselves choose to forgive others. When we choose to look at other people's sin against us and say, I don't hold it against you. Any time that we look at something and say, that person owes me, we are saying, I have the right to judge you. I have the right to hold this against you. If we choose to judge someone, then we ourselves are choosing to be judged. If we choose not to forgive, then we are choosing to be unforgiven ourselves. The Lord has said, if you do not forgive, I will not forgive you. But if you forgive others, then you can walk in the goodness and the fullness of my forgiveness. When we look at something and say, he owes me, we know that there is unforgiveness in our heart. And we must repent of that ourselves. Our sin needs to be washed away. And Jesus has made the way. As we've read through these psalms today, the Lord is wanting to just highlight different things to you as well as to me. He brought to my mind Psalm 36, where it tells us that the sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts. They have no fear of God to restrain them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is something so beautiful and yet Without it, sin finds a home. David is talking about people who are plotting against him and coming against him. And then he just stops and says, Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. His love is just so immense and so wonderful and so beautiful. We can be sheltered by his love covered by his love, hidden under the shadow of his wing. There can be stuff going on, but there is no need for us to fear because we can trust the Lord. And David then calls out and says, Lord, protect me and guard me. I know you can do it. I know what will happen to these situations because you are bigger and greater than them. I trust you, O Lord, and I thank you for your unfailing love. Today we come to the end of the first book of Psalms and we begin the second book. Almost all of the first book are, are written by David and most of the second book are as well. What we're going to see though is a transition and the Psalms that we're reading today are all what we call laments. They're all David in situations, horrible situations, all sorts of stuff is going wrong. And yet at the end of each of those Psalms he's able to be sure he calls out on the Lord. He says the Lord is the one that's looking after us. He is the one that cares for us. We get ourselves in situations and when we stop looking at the Lord, when we start looking at the situations and see them as being so big, then we will find ourselves slipping. But when we look to the Lord, when we look to him, when we look to his goodness and his love, when we know that he cares for us more than we even care for ourselves, when we look to that place, each time David finishes these psalms of lament with knowing the Lord is on his side, with knowing that even though it is bad, he will see us through. 
And that strengthens him, that encourages him, that sends him on. He knows that the Lord is just. And therefore, he doesn't need to be the one that is trying to be judging. He calls on the Lord and says, it's yours, Lord, it's not mine. I can't do a thing about this, but you can. And so he sits himself down in peace, even in the middle of difficult circumstances, knowing that the Lord is his strong tower, knowing the Lord is the one that holds him tight, knowing the Lord's love and compassion for him does not end. There are times when we get ourselves in a mess because we're trying to justify ourselves. And when we do that, we'll miss out on knowing the Lord's a strong tower and our protector. Today we're in the second book of Psalms and there's a, a bit of a difference from the first. So many of that book, the first book, were his laments when he's calling out to the Lord saying, Lord, this is what I'm going through, but I will still trust you. Here he's beginning to recognize and say, Lord, I may be going through this, but I'll do more than trust you. I'll stop looking at the stuff. I'll stop looking at the people. I'll trust you to deal with them. I've been asking you for justice. I've been asking you to come and deal with them. I've asked you to destroy them. But Lord, in the middle of this, I'm just going to trust you. I'm not going to be the one that pronounces sentences. I'll leave that to you. I trust you and I praise you. You have brought the people of Israel out from so much. You've taken them out of Egypt and brought them through the Red Sea. You've delivered them and you've delivered me. David recognises how much the Lord has delivered them. And he begins just to say, Lord, I will praise you. With my mouth I will rejoice. I will say and declare the great things you've done. And as he does this, these psalms begin to, to mould themselves away from, oh, this is how bad it is, but it's okay, the Lord will get me through, to surely the Lord is my strength. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He is the one that holds me close and I will praise him I will respond to his love for me I will respond to his protection with praise and thanksgiving and I will call upon those around me let us join together and praise the Lord let us realize how big our God is he is bigger than our needs he is big enough to hold the whole universe in his hand let's get our minds away from Oh, will God spot what's going on with me? To Lord, I thank you. I thank you because you are great and mighty. You're the one that holds the universe in your hands. And I will praise you and I will give thanks to you. And I will glorify your name. Today we're reading... Psalms from three of the five books, from the second, third and fourth ones. We're still picking on David's Psalms. And as we read them, we see a bit of a change going on. We see, first of all, David recognising that the way of just straight religion doesn't make it to God. He is looking for our heart. He is looking for our thankfulness. He's looking for things to burst out to recognise what he's done and to respond to him for what he's done. That he has saved us and delivered us and healed us and restored us. And when we realise that in our lives, we will respond with thanksgiving. And the Lord loves that thanksgiving. And then we realise that we, we need to know how to live. We don't just need rules. We need the Holy Spirit teaching us. The Word tells us that the Holy Spirit will guide you and tell us what to do. And David's crying and saying, Lord, teach me what to do. Teach me, teach me, teach me. And the last of the Psalms, he says, I've got it. I will do this. I will do that. I will do the other. Not out of a legalistic, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. The life of God purging and pulsing through him. It's so easy for us to try and live God's way after the rule book. Jesus Christ is the Word. 
he lives within us. And if we are prepared to live by his word, by his power, just manifesting his love, then the world will say, wow, we need some of that because you have what we haven't got. But if we fall for just trying to do the stuff, trying to keep ourselves good enough, we were not good enough when God called us. Why do we think we're able in our own strengths to be good enough now? He's calling us to come to him, to be filled with his spirit, to be overflowing by his spirit. And if believers are overflowing with the spirit of God, they will be so attractive to the world, the world will run and say, tell us about your God. But if we walk rigid to the law, for the law's sake, thinking we ourselves can do it, we will see ourselves as being just totally judgmental. The crazy thing is that the way we live will be in purity and holiness and in truth without compromise in either case. But what is in our heart and what overflows will win the lost. Peter quoted from Psalm 109 at the very beginning of Acts. Judas had betrayed Jesus. He's gone now. And there is a need for a replacement. And David is in that situation where he's got people who are actually coming against him. People who are so close to him becoming traitors to him. They've let him down in every way. And his heart is just pouring out. And we can try and spiritualize it, but really he's hurting. But in the Psalms before that, we see that David recognizes how he can deal with hurt, how he can deal with depression, how he can deal with disasters going on, how he can get himself back on track, because he has a responsibility. He is calling out to the Lord to do this, but he also says, it's my responsibility. Soul, wake up, get up. I will praise the Lord, I will move on, I will declare his goodness, I will, I will, I will. And he tells himself, I will do it, he tells himself to do it. How easy it is for us to say, Lord, please get me out of this mess, please help me in this thing. The Lord will help, he promises to help. But while we sit and think how worried we are and how troubled we are, our first job is tell your soul, tell my soul tell ourselves wake up praise the lord give thanks to him remember all the good that he has done and we will find ourselves being able to walk through situations that are so difficult if we allow ourselves to just continue to look at the mountains they will just keep on growing but if we look at the lord those mountains will become like molehills As we read Psalm 138, we read that David's saying that, Lord, I thank you that your promises are backed up by your name. His name is more than just Father or God or Jesus. His name is a total description of who he is and what he's done and what he is able to do. He is the Lord, my righteousness. He's given me righteousness and therefore I'm righteous. He is the Lord, my healer. He is the Lord my supply. He is the Lord in every area. He's my peace. He's my joy. He's my teacher. The name of the Lord is more than just a label. It is the very description of who he is. And then we read in Psalm 139 that he knows us completely. He is a loving father who knows us and knows us inside out. And we can be secure in that knowledge knowing who he is, that he knows everything about us. There's nothing we can hide from him, so it's foolish to do so. He is the God who sees. He's our shepherd. He knows and nourishes us, and he cares so much. It's with joy that we can run to him, knowing that he is our salvation, because he is our saviour, our redeemer, 
our master and our friend. I just haven't got over what somebody said a few weeks ago. That the more we surrender to the Lord, the more we submit to him, the greater the authority that he will give to us. His name has all power and all authority. And the more we surrender to his name, the more authority he will give to us. Today we complete our whistle-stop journey through the Psalms of David and start to look at some of the Psalms of his worship leaders. And it's perhaps fitting that Psalm 145 is, is the last of David's Psalms. What is amazing in that Psalm is that the word praise appears so many times. And to us that's just saying the same thing. But in Hebrew, each of those words of praise has a different meaning. There are seven different variations on the word praise in Hebrew and the word rejoice has at least ten and each of those words has a physical action that goes with it for instance it may be shouting out I praise I shout out your name I sing in the spirit and throwing out our arms kneeling before you worshipping in abundance laying prostrate before you in the words for rejoice, that some of them mean to spin like a top. We just recognise as we do this that our words are so empty. When it tells us to rejoice, we can't help but being excited. The Lord wants us to be able to express our love for him and our praise for him in every way. In our heart, in our mind and in our body. And David took this example, he just really explained it and just amplified it in this Psalm 145. There are so many words and constantly it is about speaking out God's greatness, singing out God's greatness, shouting out God's greatness, rejoicing and praising him for he is worthy of praise. Today we've continued reading some of Asaph's Psalms, 53, 73, 74. And in those they're all connected together. And in 73 I, I read there that Asaph says, I envied the wicked. I think we've all envied the wicked at different times. And perhaps not in their wealth and their, their glamour, but sometimes with their assurance and their security and the way that they just go about things. And I, I was struck, I have a friend who had a genuine fake Rolex and he was so proud of it, he even had a wristband that said Rolex on it. And it strikes me that that genuine fake Rolex is more valuable than a genuine Rolex that doesn't work. But if you had a genuine Rolex that worked, its value would outstrip the fake genuine by miles. And the thing is that the world sees many biblical principles and fakes them. They are genuine principles, but the world fakes them. And through that, they have something of great value. And sometimes the church tries to copy the fake as opposed to realising that the fake is copying the genuine. If we would just grab hold of what the Lord is saying in these Psalms when he says I'm not looking for your religious structures I'm not looking for your religious sacrifices I am looking for hearts that are full of thanksgiving full of the joy of knowing me full of being in my sanctuary living in my presence that that joy that peace that righteousness that kingdom life that will become so attractive that the world's fakes will have no value whatsoever. Today we've read from Psalm 75 to 78 and 
just really lovely psalms and really catch hold of some great promises there. But I was just going to look at Psalm 78. It's a long one, and as we've read through it, there's a lot of history in there. And sometimes the psalmist will tell us, remember what God has done, how he's brought us through things, reminding them of the history. And other times he does it as a warning. And today it is a warning. A warning of saying, the Lord has called you, but he's not afraid of moving the blessing on. And he begins by talking about Ephraim, and, and sometimes we don't really recognise who Ephraim was. When we go right back to Jacob and Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim are J Joseph's sons, and Jacob puts a blessing on, specifically onto Ephraim, as opposed to Manasseh. And Joshua, a Ephraimite, comes into the Promised Land as their leader. God has put his anointing on the people of Ephraim. But time and time again through Judges, we saw Ephraim turning their back on the Lord, turning their back on the promises. And then we see God saying, well, I'm leaving Ephraim behind and I'm going still to Rachel's children. And she goes, he goes to Benjamin. And we see Benjamin being blessed through Saul. And God has said, right, I've put aside Ephraim. He has not done what I called him to do. I will now put my blessing on Benjamin. And through Saul, that Saul himself turns away. And God says, now I'm putting aside Benjamin. And I'm calling on Judah. And then through Judah, we see David taking the throne. And God is saying, I am putting my blessing on to, Ju to Judah. I'm putting my blessing on to David. And David will have a son on the throne forever. Each of the others had that promise, but they failed it. God's blessing and his connection with David meant that when Solomon was due to fail and the kingdom is taken away, the promise on David is never taken away. And it is through David that we see the Messiah come, the Lord Jesus Christ. God presides over heaven's court. He judges the judges, those that have made decisions based on their own abilities and their own needs. When they've said that person is worth having that answer, they're judging people's value. Jesus said, don't judge, because if you do judge, you will be judged. He said the measure with which you judge will be the measure with which you receive judgment against you. Jesus was telling us that it isn't our place to judge whether somebody deserves to receive God's love. It is our place to show that love, to demonstrate that love. For God so loved the world that he gave his Son that whoever may believe on him will receive eternal life. But those that refuse to believe have condemned themselves. It's not our place to judge whether somebody is wrong or right. It is our place to show them the love of God. 